in the mental health field too often. We've made it seem as if it's just in your head. Just in your head. If the landlord can hijack the rent by 20%, that impacts people's mental health. We can't have a profit-driven mental health care system if we want our people to be connected and healthy. Hello, I'm Harriet Fraud. Max Golding and I are very happy to introduce two guests on It's Not Just in Your Head, Gemma and Heather, who will talk to us today about sex work. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Gemma. I'm um, a current full-service sex worker, uh, which people uh, might know of that as an escort or a prostitute. Um, I'm a former stripper as well, and I've done um, you know a bunch of different types of uh, labor within the sex industry. Uh, and I also have been um, heavily involved in sex worker organizing uh, for many years. Terrific. Heather? Hi, um, I'm Heather Berg. I teach women, gender, and sexuality studies at Washington University in St. Louis. And I write about sex work, uh, labor politics, and Marxist feminist theory. And my book, Porn Work, uh, will be out in the winter. That's really exciting. I'd like to set out, although we will go wherever we go, I would like to begin by just asking you to talk about sex work and mental health, because we all labor under so many misconceptions. Uh, yeah, so there there have actually been a couple uh, studies done recently on stigma against sex workers in mental health care, and this is a pretty new area of research. Uh, so both of these studies came out last year, and um, it's pretty clear that stigma against sex workers in mental health care, um, you know, results in uh, poor treatment outcomes and, uh, you know, resistance to treatment. And then also I have, you know, personal experience. I have uh, OCD, and I also uh, used to have, like, a drug and alcohol problem. I've been sober for five years, so I've had a lot of experiences. Um, Congrats. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I've, I have a lot of experience navigating the mental health care system as a sex worker. And, um, you know, I've just heard so many ridiculous uh, things firsthand. And, uh, you know, my comrades within the industry have as well. Uh, so, yeah, it can be really frustrating to try uh, to navigate the mental health care um, industry as a sex worker. No, we all do share, not all of us, thank goodness, but many... Um, therapists and mental health care workers share the biases of society because they're generally ignorant of questions about the society and lack a social analysis. They stay within your head, which is why Max and I call this podcast, It's Not Just in Your Head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, for sure. If, if you wouldn't mind, Gemma, actually, I'm curious, like what kinds of I don't know, stigmas or stereotypes or like those kinds of barriers and issues that maybe either you've run into personally, if you feel comfortable talking about it, or just what you're generally aware of um, that sex workers can run into um, and then and then like run away from maybe like seeking mental health care services for that reason. Yeah, for sure. So uh, yeah, I'm definitely comfortable talking about my own experiences. The first example that comes to mind is when I was in um, an intensive outpatient program for substance abuse my counselor told me that no prostitute has ever gotten sober <laughs> and that there was no way I could possibly get sober without getting a different job. Um, so when, when in fact, you know, the fact that um, I was able to work so few hours really allowed me to focus on my recovery and was really helpful to me at that time. Uh, and then also I've been told, you know, by a pretty prominent New York psychiatrist that she didn't want to take my dirty sex work money. Mm -hmm. um, and she, you know, she couldn't see me until I got another job because she didn't want to take the dirty money. Um, I know someone who's kicked out of a halfway house um, because she wouldn't quit her job. Uh, so these are just um, some examples. Um, you know, as Harriet said, you just, you can't really separate out um, cultural hegemony from uh, mental health care. So a lot of the, um, you know, the stereotypes or just, you know, the ideas of um, what a prostitute is in, in uh, the public imagination uh, come into play as well. So, you know, therapist, you know, I've had therapists who are very like titillated by it and spent the, you know, every session. Like I'm like, I'm here for OCD, which is like this really specific mm -hmm. thing. 
Um, it's really mm -hmm. clear, like what treatment modalities are helpful, but instead, you know, they just wanted to like hear about my job because they thought it was so titillating and fascinating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting because when I was writing about sex work for the book Knowledge and Class Marxism Without Guarantees, one of the arguments I found in condemning sex work is that you separate a person out from the other aspects of the, their personality, which you do in just about every job, for mm -hmm. money. So that that's all dirty money then. And yep. at least if a sex worker is an independent worker, she's not being exploited by any, anyone. Or if she's in a sex work collective like the USHA collective in Calcutta, she's one of 20,000 strong workers in a collective. Mm -hmm. The idea yeah. of exploitation is such a capitalist essence that it's strange that they compartmentalize it to condemn sex work. I think for me, one thing that's so striking is the extent to which the way that, whether it be mental health practitioners or theorists talk about sex work, really says so much more about what they think of straight or civilian work um, than what they know of sexual labor. And to that theme, I think what you're saying around the kind of um, ubiquitousness of exploitation, I'm, I'm curious to hear from you, Max and Harriet, about what piece of, of mental health training um, how that engages the idea of all labor as something that kind of takes its toll on your psyche. That isn't in our training. Uh, That's yeah, one of the reasons agreed. that Max and I have this podcast because the, they separate out the inner world from the external world. And as Max once said very um, eloquently, you know, when you're being evicted, it's not just in your head you know? mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that there is a refusal to engage in the damages of a capitalist system or any other system that I know of. And it does keep us sort of safe and naive, but it really misses the boat in terms of treatment of a whole person. That's why the liberation therapy model is better, where the individual is in the center and one part of the triangle in which she's placed is the personal and another one is the political and economic and the other is the cultural. And so that those all influence us, but that is hardly a majority theory. Just to, um, I, I have never even considered this question, Heather. So I just, I'm going to just briefly reflect, reflect on it as somebody who, you know, I'm a newer, like a fresher licensed therapist. I like finished my grad program, like five years ago or so. Mm -hmm. And I can't think of a single and I so I went to um, Antioch, uh, which is like, kind of considered a social justice sort of, mm. I guess, left esque leaning, um, sort of uh, grad school for mm -hmm. therapists and other other people going to school for other things. And I can't think of a single time when we if, if I can't think of any sort of Marxian or Marx esque analysis of like labor and exploitation and how that connects to mental health, to be like totally honest with you. Mm -hmm. There was, um, I think there's a, a bigger surge in the mental health world right now around like cultural competency. And there's all these like changing terms. They change like every six months. It was a cultural competence. And then it was, I think now it's a cultural humility, but it was something else before um, or like cultural awareness. Um, so there's there's some identity based uh, social justice emphases in the programs now, and they're pretty embedded in most programs, to my understanding. But the labor exploitation and mental health connection, to my knowledge, is maybe it's in some programs. I've never heard of one that talks mm -hmm. about that. So that's true, and it yeah. since what motivates sex work and workers of any kind, what motivates people to go out to work has a lot to do with the economic circumstances of their lives. I was hoping that you would talk a little bit about what motivates sex workers to choose the job. Yeah, so, you know, in a capitalist context, almost everyone is forced to work in order to survive. Um, mm -hmm. And there's, you know, there's a lack of access um, to decent work, uh, you know, that for more and more people, really. And um, also, you know, specifically for... Um, for certain groups. 
And so you see that in sex work, uh, for example, like 40% of black trans women report participating in the sex trade. Um, so, you know, lack of access to other work, um, lack of access uh, to decent employment for working class people in general, uh, wages have stagnated and cost of living has continued to rise. Um, and so in some cases, you know, someone, um, you know, there might have employment opportunities available to them, but none of them pays a living wage. Uh, and, and sex work can pay a lot more per hour than other work. Uh, so that's another thing. Um, if typical work hours aren't possible for someone, let's say due to chronic illness or being a single parent, then sex work could be a lot more manageable than other work. Um, and even if, you know, uh, that isn't the case, um, you know, being able to, let's say you can make $900 for a few hours of work instead of a week or a week and a half of toiling away, making a profit for someone else. Um, mm -hmm. You know, th there's there's obviously an appeal to that. And, uh, and I'll just yeah. add that. Oh, please. Go ahead. Oh, no, Heather, <laughs> I want to hear from you. Oh. <laughs> Um, well, I'll just add that, you know, I think that one thing that I'm always trying to get other Marxists to understand is that, yes, as Gemma says, like so much of this is about finding a way out of no way, as um, Black feminist historians mm. have described it, but also um, but that folks who have options to other jobs make a choice to refuse them and sex work exists as a thing that let, makes that possible. And I think that that's important for for both Marxists, perhaps would-be allies, and also anti-sex worker feminists to understand that, that this isn't just a, a kind of choice of last resort, but can often represent a way of saying no to other things, whether that be staying in an abusive domestic violence situation or, um, for the purposes of this podcast, just the daily toll of working under a boss in an office. Um, I recently spoke with someone who just talked about what it meant for her to not be under fluorescent lights at the end of the day. These little mm -hmm. things that, that we sort of take for granted in the world of straight work. Yeah, I think it's relevant that although, at least before the pandemic, women on average earned 81 or 82 percent of what men earned for, this, for similar work, there's two things. One is mothers earn at most 69% of what men earn who are fathers or not fathers. And so they're further set back. And single mothers are two thirds of minimum wage workers. And so you have even further constraints. In fact, as far as I know, sex work is the only labor in which women tend to be paid more than men. That would be an attraction to the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my understanding. Yeah, that's what the statistics say. And it makes something like doing, being a sugar baby to pay your tuition, an opportunity that ironically puts women ahead of men who had to be in debt mm -hmm. for 20 years on average to pay off their tuition. So there's very few places in which we have an advantage. That's the only one I can think of, and that would be an attraction to sex work. It also might be interesting to look at those forces that condemn sex work in the United States now. Yeah, so the, I think there... Oh, go, go ahead, Heather. No, no, you go ahead. Um, okay, yeah, I think I think there are several factors at play. Uh, so first of first of all, it's just a um, a strong reaction to sex based on subjective ideas that people have about sex, uh, religious or metaphysical or whatever, like thinking sex should only occur in a specific context or else it's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and these ideas about morals or whatever that are totally uh, individual and have no place in legislation, uh, kind of similar to drug criminalization in that way. Like there's ample evidence uh, available about what keeps people the safest. And obviously that's what we should do. Um, but instead of doing what the data suggests is most effective, people's emotions sort of take over. Um, and then specifically in terms of um, the left, uh, I think, you know, there's an element of dogmatism. There's an element of general uh, anti-lumpen attitudes. Um, mm. It also can be this sort of socially acceptable way to be misogynistic uh, mm. because it's like directed at the bad women 
So, yeah. oh, I'd never, you know, I'd never, you know, say anything bad about respectable women, but then they use this really misogynistic language to describe sex workers and sex work. Mm. Um, yeah. Then, then one other thing is um, there's a lot of propaganda um, around sex trafficking right now, conflating all sex work with trafficking. Uh, mm. So, you know, sex, tra- sex trafficking, you know, obviously is a thing that really exists and it's abhorrent. Um, but the information that we're all getting about it is uh, largely false. Uh, there are a bunch of profit-driven uh, NGOs that are pumping out a bunch of lies, um, many of which are based on um, like a white slavery panic. Um, mm. It's very racist. If you look up, um, you know, some of the anti-trafficking propaganda, you'll see a lot of images of like a white girl with a brown hand covering her mouth. Mm. Um, oh yeah, and then then. Um, this idea that sex work is all trafficking is kind of paired with um, this assertion that all sex work is rape, uh, which is, you know, a common argument you'll hear, you know, like consent to sex can't be given um, in the context of exchange of money. So, um, yeah, which that's, that's a big problem, you know, first of all, because, you know, when we do experience unique acts of violence at work, we aren't taken seriously. And there's this element of victim blaming. We're blamed, you know, for our own rapes um, and beatings because, you know, we chose mm-hmm. dangerous work. Um, and then also, uh, just one more thing, the idea that sex can only be consented to if there's no money involved and both parties are motivated solely by uh, sexual pleasure. You know, that means that, you know, much of the sex that people have had within heterosexual marriages um, you know, historically has been rape. And, and it, you know, that's just ridiculous. Um, you know, rape, rape is rape and people know when they're being raped or not. Uh, mm-hmm. People have sex for all, all kinds of reasons. Um, mm-hmm. Not, not just for sexual pleasure. Mm-hmm. Well, the, fact, the consent. It, go sorry, ahead, one, Max, I'm sorry. Just a real quick thing is like, I, you know, the, the idea that something can't be consensual if there's money involved kind of calls into the, the, it calls into question wage labor in general. Like if, if, the, if you follow the logic, like what, what job could anyone really consent to if they're doing it for a wage? Right. Like, <laughs> right, I mean, that's, right. the, that's the inevitable conclusion of that logic, I think. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and I don't think, you know, we, we can really consent to labor, but I also think you have to separate out the idea of sexual consent in this context. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, I don't consent to work. I have to work or else I can't, you know, whatever, pay my rent or buy food. Um, But that doesn't mean that I'm being raped every time I go to my job. You Mm -hmm. know, there within that there, you know, there, there can be sexual consent or not. Well, it it also just calls into question. Well, sorry, my brain is my like a bad sleep. I'm going to edit this out. Um, of why sex workers are scapegoated as like the, I mean, maybe not the only ones, but some, one of the most easily scapegoated. Like this work is really exploitative, and we need to talk about that, and just not talking about the exploitativeness of the economy as a whole, and right. somehow like saying that sex work just is somehow there's a special kind of exploitation that's happening. That's just somehow magically very, very different than um, all other forms of wage labor. Yeah. I think if I could do a little bit of my own psychologizing here, I think Mm. that a lot of that is about the way that sex work can be a kind of holding container for Mm. everything that folks outside of sex work are anxious about, whether that be their own Mm -hmm. engagements with, as Gemma says, um, you know, lackluster sex in the context of normative relationships. But also I think about the kinds of people who are making, um, who are doing theorizing about sex work and they're people who are wrapped up in all sorts of their own exploitative labor relationships. They are feminists who rely on domestic labor. They are Mm -hmm. department faculty who have secretaries. They are people who, who couldn't exist without all sorts of intimate and unpaid racialized labor. And I think that for their own kind of psychic well-being, it does a lot to imagine that exploitation is this thing outside of that. It's a denial of capitalist exploitation. And it's interesting that Cardi B's song, WAP, are you both familiar with that? Yes. (laughs) That what it does is, is say it gives some people a real thrill by saying we'll exploit them. 
for their money mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. than they are exploiting us. And that's, she says in the beginning, there's whores in this house, but it's obvious that what she's doing is not in the brothel, but in regular life. And it's so much, that selling sex is so much a part of culture that Richard Pryor had a whole bit where there's a couple fighting and he comes downstairs, his daughter's fighting with her boyfriend. And he says, what the hell's the matter here? And the boyfriend says, I took her out and paid $50 for dinner and she won't put out. And he says, $50, call your mother down, right? Mm. Because the idea is the man pays for the date and you pay him back sexually was the expectation. It's such a marbleized thread through the culture of that to then decide that it's there's something completely different here. And it's the only place where the logic of capitalism operates is really something I think that has been imposed on us by Abrahamic religions. Because yeah. a prostitute in the Bible, the word for prostitute, meant a woman who takes it upon herself to be sexual outside of her father's arrangements for her. And he could hire her out to a lot of people. She's not a prostitute. But if she went out on her own, she would be. It's a woman operating outside of patriarchal constraints. Right. That's something that's so interesting about that is... Uh, you know, I get asked so often or have gotten asked so often over, you know, the course of my career, both by clients and, and uh, you know, other people, what does your dad think about you doing this? It's always framed in terms of male approval or also like, huh. do you have a boyfriend? Do you have a husband? What does he think? Does he let you do this? And it's always, do you find it's it's always like the mom or boyfriend question? It's not, I don't know. It's not like it's it's dad it's not or like boyfriend. what is your or sorry sorry it's again my brain is not working um yeah like nobody's ever like what does your mom think it's just like never. what's your dad thing never it's so interesting mm -hmm. yeah well the purity cults in the south a woman pledges her father and gets a purity ring she pledges that she will remain loyal to her father and not take on any lovers until she's married which is that he owns her sexuality until it's given to another man. And it is relevant that it wasn't till the 2000s that all 50 states condemned marital rape because a woman is then, her sexuality was owned by her husband and it's still expected to be. These are all of these biases that you go against the rules of patriarchal power when you use your sexuality the way you want to. And I'm interested in how you organize how you reach other sex workers to be a cohesive force for change. Uh, so first of all, uh, you know, a common misconception about sex worker organizing is that it's all, you know, middle class and wealthy white women uh, in the West. And it, that's just a total erasure of so many people doing wonderful work, uh, both here in the U.S. and all over the world. Um, who don't fit that description. There's an entire book that came out recently on sex worker organizing in Africa. Uh, Harriet mentioned uh, India is really advanced in their organizing. Um, so, you know, this is a, a global movement that is, uh, you know, uniformly asking for decriminalization of sex work. Um, so organizing, you know, with sex workers, I think uh, the, the, difficulty that I come across is like, you know, like any big, broad group of people, um, they're, you know, the dominant ideology is liberalism. And so that's going to be pres present within that. And so that can be difficult. Um, and then as a communist trying to organize, you know, um, with communists who aren't sex workers, that can pose a lot of difficulties. And I've had mm -hmm. some very, very bad experiences, um, with that, that, um, that make it, you know, really hard to sustain. And I also, I did a, um, a survey recently about this, about um, leftist sex workers trying to organize with parties and just the vast majority of um, the respondents reported that they feel totally alienated uh, mm -hmm. from organizing outside of, um, you know, sex work specific organizing. 
-hmm. That makes sense. And I think the IWW would probably be the best source for organizing outside of the AFL-CIO, which is so cowardly and unclass conscious. You know, in the book Revolting Prostitutes that Gemma, you recommended, the book by Juno Mack and Molly Smith, they talk about why don't those ostensible reformers ask, what are the economic conditions of existence for prostitution and try to change those if they're so interested in change, which doesn't <laughs> seem to be part of their discourse, which is rather finger pointing and condemning on some morality that, that doesn't encompass the immorality of exploitation, which would change right. the whole business. Yeah, and it's just so striking that that sneaks in even into left ideologies. Um, I think just one thing I'll add in terms of the barriers to organizing question is that the kind of increasing reach of government surveillance has made organizing that much harder. I'm thinking mm -hmm. about laws such as FOSTA and SESTA and the recently proposed Earn It Act, which if you're listening and it hasn't already been passed, please call your senator. Um, mm -hmm. But the state, just as much as it doesn't want working class women and queers to be able to make money on their own terms, it really doesn't want us talking to each other. And I think that that is such a barrier to organizing. Um, and it really should be a concern for the labor left more broadly, because sex workers will be the first, but not the last. Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, um, we had this amazing convention, uh, sex work convention, Desiree Alliance. And, um, you know, they had to, you know, cancel indefinitely because um, organizing such a convention after sesta fossa could be construed as sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. And that's something I really think a lot of people in the left don't understand. So I'll hear this often, you know, from from like dudes who like don't know anything about sex work, have never talked to any sex workers in their entire life have never, you know, done any investigation into what organizing we're already doing. And they say, oh, well, yeah, I mean, I guess like, you know, we should just go in and try to organize the sex workers. And like what they don't realize <laughs> is like they're legally, you know, pimps if they do that, uh, mm -hmm. at, at least in the United States. Absolutely. Yeah. I think I we hear that so much, right, from, from the kind of left Twitter is always suggesting a union as if we've never thought of it. And I think <laughs> another piece there is um, that particularly in the context of the community that I do most of my work with, which is porn workers, um, one thing that the labor left often misunderstands is that an actual barrier to organizing, but one that's not reducible to people having bad politics, is that a lot of people really would prefer to be independent contractors to mm -hmm. employees. And, um, and many people are bosses some of the time when they produce their own content. And even the Wobblies, I think you're right, Harriet, that they're our best bet. But even the Wobblies, you know, have these kind of inherited ideas about workers and bosses being totally separate. And I think that the left is going to have to revise some of that thinking in order to make sense of organizing in the 21st century. Yeah, it's, there's this real um, desire to assign some kind of class character, I think, to sex work in general, mm -hmm. when in reality, it's a huge, really varied in industry where you have, you know, a total range of, of labor conditions varying from, you know, someone doing wage work, working at a brothel, um, mm -hmm. that's straightforwardly wage work in the same way that working retail would be, you know, up into you know, a really high earning independent escort who has, you know, several employees and is a landlord. So there's just, there's a big, there's a big range. And then, you know, some people, you know, might categorize sex workers in general as lumpen. Um, but even, you know, even full service sex work isn't illegal, you know, globally. And here in the United States, uh, you know, porn's legal, stripping's legal. Uh, there are all these legal forms of sex work. So that, that doesn't really make sense either. Can no, I, it doesn't. Of, <clears throat> oh, a, I'm sorry. A, a, oh, Go just ahead, like, well, a term in, terminology. I'm thinking of like listeners that might not be familiar with, um, like Lumpen or the lot, like mm. the Earn It Act, and I forgot if it's Sesca. Sesca Fosta. Mm -hmm. Could could y'all like maybe just clarify a little bit for like listeners that are ignorant or as ignorant as I am about some of these mm -hmm. things? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so SESTA is the Stop Enabling Online Sex Trafficking Act. Um, FOSTA was its version in the House. Um, and the Earn It Act would, so what FOSTA and SESTA did was increase the 
reach of of federal penalties for any third party platforms that would could be accused of facilitating sex trafficking, but because of the kind of deliberate muddying of the waters of any kind of boundary between trafficking and sex work, this means that all platforms that sex workers use to advertise, to screen their clients for safety, and to communicate and organize with each other uh, are vulnerable to these forms of surveillance, and many have shut down. Um, the Earn and Act, just really briefly, would uh, would increase the reach of this and also by, most importantly, by ending encryption. So really that's something also that your mental health practitioner listeners should care about, that all of these services that allow us to communicate privately with each other um, mm -hmm. would be at risk. And by encryption, can you explain to the listeners mm -hmm. what you mean there? Oh, sure. Well, so, um, so for folks who... Uh, you know, want to text anyone from their weed dealer to their therapist, uh, to a sex worker they're trying to book, book with, for example, um, apps such as Signal that many people used in organizing around the protest for Black Lives. Um, all of these services uh, rely on some levels of information privacy, um, and the Earn It Act would undermine those. That is kind of the layman's version. I think. Uh, yeah, the, I've, I've. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I think one of the things that really helped me to understand it is non-determinist Marxism, because if you look at what is class, class is who does the work and who gets to take the profit from the work and distribute it. And if you look at sex work, then you could either have communal sex work, like you have in the big USHA sex cooperative in Calcutta, where all the proceeds are shared and everyone's in it together, either doing the sex work or they produce their own condoms and they have their own bank and they produce their own sanitary products all communally. Or you could have capitalist sex work in which one person, like you have in the brothels, where one person makes a profit off another person's sex work or independent sex work where a a sex worker independently does the sex work and appropriates, appropriates and distributes the profits. And that the crime here is exploitation, not work, not the sex work. And I think right. that's a very useful Marxian way of looking at it, though it's not a um, majority Marxian way of looking at it. Yeah, um, I'd love to address the question of, of what is the lump and proletariat in this context, because I think that's a really big part of it. Um, these anti lump and attitudes that I mentioned. Uh, so Marx refers to the lump and proletariat as social scum or the criminal class. Um, you know, remember Marx, Marx himself um, was never in a position where he needed to, you know, resort to crime to survive. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, um, and, and, and as I mentioned earlier, I think there's a lot of dogmatism because there are, you know, uh, incredible thinkers who have, um, you know, I think much more advanced ideas about the lump and proletariat. Uh, for example, uh, Fanon and Huey Newton. Um, so the, the idea also is that, that the lump and proletariat lacks class consciousness and um, is incapable um, of, of achieving class consciousness. And, and to me, I think this is just, you know, um, ridiculous on so many levels. I mean, I think, first of all, it's like, especially as um, we we are in, you know, such a precarious situation here economically in the United States, it's like people move in and out of, of the criminal class, you know, mm. all the time, um, or have, you know, low paying uh, wage labor jobs and, you know, deal some drugs on the side or, um, so, so it's not so cut and dry. And then the, the one other thing I'd mention is, is um, you know, the, the idea of the lump and proletariat in the context of America is a highly racialized idea. Yes. Uh, you know, which, which um, is, is addressed um, by Huey Newton. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, black workers face higher rates of unemployment because of discrimination, barriers in access to education, so forth. And uh, I, th I think you can't separate those ideas out. So I think, you know, having a, a, an anti lumpen attitude in the context of this country where people have such, um, you know, unequal access to decent work 
is pretty messed up. I, I agree. And I also think that the idea that it isn't a crime for Jeff Bezos to tell lies about the safety of his warehouses and have people come down with COVID and exploit them to the, the extent that he does, the richest man in the world, to me, that really does look like he's a criminal. And how you define criminal is very important because you define those people who make money in capitalist enterprises, even if there is as much a criminal as Kushner is on his rents and and uh, Trump is, are not considered criminals because they're rich and can right. get Right, the away ruling class makes it. the laws. They're, they're, they're the ruling class laws. And so, that, you know, for, for uh, you know, an alleged communist, um, you know, to, to discard, you know, whole, uh, this whole giant group of people because mm. they, you know, break laws created by the ruling class mm. just seems so obviously ridiculous. Yeah, mm-hmm. for their own benefit and to establish a status quo, like all these laws that they're passing now against demonstrators because they don't want people to speak up about their rights. It's a perfect example. Who's a criminal? Who isn't? I'm curious what y'all think like about why, like, so these laws that are being passed that are, are really negatively impacting sex workers and the ability for sex workers to organize, are they like, are they deliberate attempts to to do that are sex workers sort of collateral damage in some of these efforts and are they coming from more of like an ideological place for certain um parts of society are they sort of capitalist tactics to extract more value out of people in certain ways because i you know i haven't looked into any of this too much but i'm curious Gemma and heather what you think did that even make sense i don't know yeah no it definitely did i well um, yeah, I think uh, for me, I think it, it is an ideological move and it's one that that lines up with uh, with a long history of the ruling class making laws that force people into wage labor, especially when economies are in crisis. Um, and so the sex worker writer Tamara McLeod wrote a piece when Fossil Sessa came out um, that I think really laid this out beautifully that talks about Fossil Sesta as an enclosure movement, um, mm. which is to say as, as a movement that is specifically geared towards forcing people out of independent ways of, of income generation and toward wage labor. And I think that especially as Harriet, as you mentioned, these kind of different modes of organizing the work, whether that be independent or, mm. or wage, one of the most striking effects of laws like FOSTA SESTA is to make it much more difficult to operate independently. And in in the wake of FOSTA SESTA, so many workers had to go back to extractive relationships with managers, whether those be sex work managers or pimps um, or big porn studios in this case, or on the other hand, um, folks who were forced back to retail, food service, et cetera. So for me, there is an ideological base here, absolutely. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think um, there's there's always either or, uh, you know, uh, it, it is like, you know, ideologically um, con- constructed intentionally to harm sex workers or we are so dehumanized in these people's minds that, you know, something harming us is completely ir- irrelevant. Uh, there's, you know, a group, I live in the Bay Area, and there's um, a neighborhood group in San Francisco that had this whole campaign to eradicate the prostitutes in the neighborhood um, and to also to eradicate the homelessness. And so it's the homeless, so there's this, um, yeah, de- this really dehumanizing um, language and really uh, this attitude that we are subhuman and and therefore, you know, if something uh, fucks us over, it really just is inconsequential. I also think that they sold it on the basis that it was some kind of morality crusade to save the women rather mm-hmm. than, and some naive souls might have believed it. Yeah, and children as well. Um, 
you know, and people, I, it, the, the parallels to, you know, um, rhetoric that was used uh, against, uh, you know, the gay and lesbian uh, movement are really striking. The like, won't somebody think of the children uh, idea? I worked at a child abuse treatment clinic. It was more than that, but that was kind of the, the primary thing um, out of grad school. And there there was there were these weird um, narratives. I think it had to do with funding sources and the relationships that we have to have to. Well, not not we. I no longer work there, but they that they had to and have to have with local law enforcement and larger state bodies to to continue getting funding to provide services. And that um, there were these these narratives like. Uh, you know, this person uh, is a survivor of child sexual abuse or human trafficking or something, and their stories come out front uh, at these like galas and stuff for like fundraisers. Mm -hmm. And you get like law enforcement people and they're saying we're going after the traffickers. Uh, and so we're going into the, like the gang territories and we're getting the bad guys and stuff. And it always just sort of it. um it always felt weird to me, like they were using certain stories to justify uh, going after, I mean, largely um, like Latino uh, immigrant and undocumented communities, at least where I live. Uh, I don't know if it if it takes a different form in other areas, but it, it always felt a little bit ingen ingenuous to me, but it didn't really seem like something we could talk about critically because then it seemed like you were a sort of anti-survivor or something Right. They really explicitly frame it that way a lot of the time. And it's really manipulative because what are we mm. actually doing? We're not talking about, you know, uh, services for LGBT youth who are kicked out of their homes, which obviously we can mm. all agree, you know, is a good thing. What we're talking about is sicking police on people and, mm. you know, something, you know, people go, you know, go do a Google search for Celeste Guap. Um, you know, the, the police, mm are really not, you know, safe people. Uh, like, look at the, you know, the the, the rates of domestic violence among mm. police. Um, you know, poli police are, right, po police right. are, you know, one of the greatest sources of danger mm -hmm. um, right. to, and to, to women in general and, you know, survivors in general. Um, mm -hmm. They're, they're, you know, they're not there, they're not there to help. Mm -hmm. No, and they're often, the police often, extort sexual services from sex workers in order not to report them. They have a terrible record on that also. Yep. So that it, rather than deal with whatever issue that they feel is an underlying issue, the perfect example is runaways who run away from abusive situations and can't live any other way. They don't deal with how to set up alternatives to abusive nuclear families all nuclear families, period. Rather, and they return children to the abusive families from which they came. And also, don't address the actual social problem so that their moral outreach is highly suspect. And yet, of course, there are some naive people who don't know enough to suspect the system or are afraid to, who go along with it. With right, things right. Like foster sister, so women can't protect each other by communicating. Yeah, I do think it's really disingenuous. Just one other thing I'd add is that there are really pervasive problems with uh, labor trafficking and agriculture and uh, domestic mm. labor in this country. Yep. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, um, you know, these these anti sex trafficking uh, NGOs, for the most part, uh, don't acknowledge that. You know, and as Heather said, a lot of these, um, you know, wealthy white women. Uh, you know, employ uh, very, you know, underpaid, exploited, exploited domestic workers themselves. Mm -hmm. They also don't seem to attack the buy a bride from China with pictures of Little Lotus who you could adopt, which is another way mm -hmm. of sex trafficking, which they ignore because mon money pays for it. And it seems much more mm -hmm. out front. You can buy a wife. And I, I remember when I was doing some writing the article I wrote on sex work, I was looking it up, and I guess some algorithm thought I was interested in buying a wife or something. <laughs> so I got all sorts of ads from Baltic countries and Southeast Asia where I could buy a woman as a wife, which is... Did you? No, I, I resisted what was not at all a temptation. <laughs> okay, just, no, it, just curious. It, 
seemed totally terrifying to me. Well, I think, and, you know, I, at least in my field, that the same feminists who are anti-sex work are critical of, yes. of the male order bride context. But I mm-hmm. think that, but again, what they, what both of these things allow them to miss is, I guess, on, on two fronts of one, um, as Gemma was saying, like the, these global flows of racialized labor um, that, mm. that are so much wider, but also that I think, you know, there's even in the context of, of the mail order brides that you're talking about, um, I think that there's this need to acknowledge the ways that that is obviously exploitative and born of histories of globalization, but also um, that women who make that call are often saying no to other things. Um, and so I think our task, whether that be as mental health practitioners or or organizers or uh, other folks inside and outside is to kind of take those things seriously at the same time. I also think within the sex negative and ambivalent weirdness of America, where children get their sex education from porn because they don't have reasonable sex education in school, within that environment, these sex work is condemned in a particular moralistic way that the puritanical orthodox evangelicals and Jewish sects continue and it's accompanied by the inferior position of women. The Baptist Conference on Men and Women, which is adopted by the Southern Baptists throughout the United States, and it's the biggest denomination, particularly address the idea that women should be subordinate to men. Men should be protective, but women must be subordinate. And if women go out on their own, then they are insubordinate. And it's interesting that um, in uh, when, what, what's his name, Jimmy Swaggart was caught going to prostitutes on the commercial strip, he was reported by them and outed by them because he wouldn't pay them. And he said he wouldn't pay them because they were doing something immoral, <laughs> even though he was a customer. <laughs> And so that there is this bizarre condemnation of prostitution as immoral by those who patronize it. And somehow they are exempted because they're pointing a finger at someone else. Right. That, 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 um, you know, doesn't make for very good clients either. And there's, there are so many regional differences, you know, here in the U S um, you know, having worked, you know, now I'm in the Bay area, which is, um, you know, a place where, uh, people, you know, it's probably the most like sex positive, um, place in the United States. Um, and so people, you know, people, a lot of people, um, are a lot more comfortable talking more openly about sex. They know more about um, sexual health and safety, that sort of thing. And I think that kind of attitude with the clients is a lot less common here. Um, And Mm -hmm. then, you know, I've worked in the South, uh, in New Orleans, and that kind of attitude is really prominent. And it it really does tend to lead to, to, you know, bad behavior ranging Mm -hmm. from, you know, sort of irritating behavior Mm -hmm. to, to like, you know, to really frightening violent behavior. Yeah, because they hate themselves because they've put this need, their need is criminalized, not the way it's handled. And I think then we have this whole other class of client, which is the the sort of self-identified good guy. And mm. that is mm. exhausting on its own terms. So um, <laughs> <laughs> I think, or, or as you're talking about the Bay Area, I'm also just thinking about queer and feminist porn where... Um, even the way I've gendered the good good guy client is wrong, but where folks have like absorbed feminist critiques of porn to such an extent that they really demand that performers be there, not just for the money, but because they want to be. And what that does for workers, whether you're you know a barista or a sex worker, is that you have to work that much harder to convince people oh, yeah. that you don't need the money. Yeah, and do the emotional work of being so pleased about it. 
right <laughs> extra emotional labor also yeah. they deny yeah. something that ventakesh who's a professor at uh, columbia said that 40% of high end sex work doesn't involve anything like intercourse but it involves intimacy being held and talked to and listened to which yeah, is yeah i mean if we're talking if we're talking like by um you know by the minute during a session uh that's that's you know you know probably like in my in my experience and i i've worked you know in a lot of different ways over the time i've been in the sex industry and i started doing you know really low paid uh sex work and have sort of worked my way up to making um you know, higher wages. Um, and, and definitely like at this point, you know, I would say it's like probably 80% of the time I spent with my clients, spend with my clients is, um, doing other things. Yeah. Psychological work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was going to ask what you, I guess oh, just ahead, one thing. I'll, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 please. Okay. Uh, just one thing I'll say about that study is that a lot of people read it and, and bring their own um, ideas about sex being worse than other forms of emotional labor to their read. And so mm -hmm. they might assume that, oh, well, this is good news if most of the work is not sex. Um, but that's <laughs> only true if you believe that sex is more injurious or more harmful than pretending to care while someone tells you their life story. And so right. I think that that's just something to, to watch for in our own kind of reading. Right. And it's totally subjective. That's just totally subjective. You know, yeah. for some, for it could be either way. And it also could be either way for one person, depending on the client. Mm -hmm. And I was going to pose this question, like kind of, to, I mean, to me and Harriet and to the two of you, but like, you know, what actually is the difference between like what me and Harriet do for a mm -hmm. living and what like sex workers do for a living, right? Like, because I can kind of think if I'm if I have like a session with a client, like you guys are talking about um, like the way we're talking about sex work is reminding me when I'm sitting in like consultation meetings with therapists and like blah, 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 this client, that client sort of frustrations with that client are like, oh, we're making progress or like this is a really good session or something. It actually sounds like it's sort of the process is almost identical in a lot of ways. Um, and that there's sort of like ideal clients that I have therapeutically. There's like certain sessions that are like just really exhausting in certain ways. Um, there's like some clients where I'm like, I really think it'd be good to try to discontinue the relationship sooner than later. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, the the main difference just seems to be something physical, um, like a certain kind of intimacy. But even in psychotherapy, like there is a certain kind of um, emotional intimacy um, that, you know, obviously there's there's like hugely rigid boundaries in place there. But I don't know if you all have thoughts on the similarities or differences or or if because I've never looked into this either, like the sort of feminist discourse on this, I, I would assume that there is some writing on this somewhere. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 have, a, I have some thoughts on this. I think, you know, um, first of all, there are some obvious similarities, like I think, especially in like, um, between like a private uh, practice, someone who's uh, running a private practice doing psychotherapy and, mm -hmm. um, and an escort. Um, however, I think it's, you know, really important um, for men who need therapy to seek therapy instead of going mm -hmm. to sex workers. Mm -hmm. um, Great yeah, point. I think, you know, we're, for the most part, you know, we're not trained psychologists um, or, mm -hmm. or counselors. And, you know, also, I think it, it really depends um, on the individuals. But I think uh, I would imagine you are able to be critical of um, of your client's yes. behavior and and uh, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. in a way that probably a lot of sex workers wouldn't feel comfortable doing. And it you know there might be a little more mm -hmm. uh, in some cases uh, like ego stroking, but that you know that and that's not always mm -hmm. true, but um, it yeah. definitely can be. I think that's true. Plus oh. anything that outside of a medical context that has to do with the body has the whole freight of Puritanism behind it. And we don't do body work with our clients by and large, although there are some modalities that do, that isn't the central feature. And there's a very strict mind body split in the Puritanism to which Americans adhere. And so that if you do work around the body you are condemned in a way that you wouldn't be otherwise. 
It's also important to understand that for men brought up within our sexist society, one of the only times they're allowed to be emotional is in a sexual context with a woman, which doesn't feel somehow that they're being unmanned. Oh, yeah. I I have guys tell me stuff all the time that they say, you know, I'm the only person they've ever told. And personally, I will encourage, you know, uh, someone who says that to talk to other people and to seek out um, a support system. Um, but yeah, I do think, unfortunately, that's the reality is, you know, there. And again, this really depends on where you are um, in the world or even, you know, in, in this country. Uh, but I do think, you know, there are a lot of men who are not comfortable going to a therapist, but they mm-hmm. are comfortable uh, seeing a sex worker. And, I, and, and one more thing yeah. about like when I see clients like that, for me personally, I make it really clear, you know, like I'm an entertainer, essentially. Mm-hmm. I'm like here to show you a good time. I'm, I'm not a therapist and I highly recommend you mm-hmm. seek out a therapist. Therapy is great. I can tell you, you know, where you can go start looking. Uh, but that's, you know, not not my job. Yeah, people who um, do people with fetishes and stuff are particularly adhering to some kind of psychosexual need. Anyway, I'm sorry to interrupt, please. Oh, no, I was just going to add, you know, as you're talking um, about just like making these really strict boundaries and, and also knowing um, even on one's own terms, like what those boundaries are. I I will say that, that one distinction between sex work and other kinds of, of less stigmatized um, kind of intimate labor seems to me to be that sex workers are, are less wrapped up in these kind of bourgeois work ethic ideas. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, like really a lot better at (laughs) knowing how to separate themselves from the work. And so Mm -hmm. that's just Mm -hmm. to say that I think that the differences don't only exist in the negative, but that sometimes being kind of outside Mm -hmm. of those systems makes us um, better able to, to see with some critical distance. This is a, a really important discussion. I have a client at 3.30. Mm-hmm. So if there's anything that we want to bring up, I would want to do it now. Mm-hmm. You know, because we have talked about who are the forces that are condemning sex work and the difficulties organizing sex work. Before we go, mm-hmm. I, I am impressed by the successes of sex work organizing in spite of all the prohibitions. And I wondered if either of you could comment on that. Yeah. um, So I think, first of all, you know, there's a lot of community available uh, to people who, who find it and having, you know, friends and comrades who, uh, who also do sex work uh, can really help. Um, I do think, you know, uh, alienation, um, is just part of, uh, be, you know, existing in this context, but it, you know, it can be lessened, uh, via human connection and having, uh, strong support systems. And, and at least for me, you know, associating with people, uh, you know, in my personal life who have a bunch of bad ideas about this stuff is just too taxing. Yeah. So I just, I just don't do it. I, can I see, see you know, I see a therapist, I see, I have a therapist that really helps too. Um, you know, someone who is anti-capitalist and who has a really good understanding of sex work. Um, and I know that might be easier, you know, to find uh, here in the Bay area than, than elsewhere. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But it's, it's very helpful. Mm-hmm. I, I'm wondering if either of you would want to plug different projects or resources for listeners. Also things maybe through email later, you can send us links, but we can put links into the description of the episode for kind of further exploration for any listeners. But is there anything that you guys want to plug? My book, Porn Work, will be out in late winter 2021, and it's available for pre-order now. Good. I want to recommend the book that Gemma recommended to me, Revolting Prostitutes, The Fight for Sex Workers' Rights, Juno Mack and Molly Smith. I found that really wonderfully written, politically exciting, and terrific. Do you women both approve of that book? Yes, another book that is uh, that will be released in the winter is called We Too: Essays on Sex Work and Survival, 
and I think would be a really useful resource for, for both um, other workers and for mental health practitioners who are trying to do better by their clients. Yeah, so if there are any uh, Marxist uh, sex workers interested in joining a reading group uh, just for Marxist sex workers, you can find uh, Whore Evolution, uh, our reading group on Twitter at who, W-H-O underscore revolution. By the way, listeners, if you have enjoyed anything you've heard Harriet say in this program, you will definitely enjoy Capitalism Hits Home, which is a solo program that Harriet does through Democracy at Work, which is a worker-owned cooperative that produces other great programs such as Economic Update with Richard Wolf and the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles with David Harvey. I can't recommend enough that everyone also listen to Capitalism Hits Home if you enjoy It's Not Just in Your Head. Capitalism Hits Home is a sort of broader over- overhead view. It explores the way that capitalism shapes our personal lives, our psyches, our relationships, our families, and it looks particularly at the sea change in American personal life as all Americans but the top 10 or 20 percent of Americans have our security and our chance for a future become as precarious as it always was for minorities and families headed by women. It's not just in your head and capitalism hits home are definitely complimentary. And if listeners would like to check out Capitalism Hits Home, Harriet, where should they go to find it? Either on YouTube or Democracy at Work or on my own website, harrietfraud.com.